Well, you can't accept. You know that I have chosen him as my husband. I am the eldest. I am the heir. Why would he pick you over me? You have nothing to offer him. But Lucinda, father would have wanted me to have my share of his fortune. Father died without making a will. If you marry the man I love, I swear on his grave, Beatrice, that I will cut you off with a pittance. It will be over my dead body that you and your cur set foot inside this house again. Ah, Lucinda, um, have you told her, Beatrice? Yes, but... You are not welcome in my house, sir. Uh, please, give us a chance to explain. Please, Anthony, can you make her listen to reason? She says she will leave me homeless and without my inheritance. But... But, but you can't. Uh, your father would never have allowed this. Get out of my house, sir, and take this scheming young vixen with you. Uh, please. Uh, Beatrice loves you, and, and I've always valued our friendship. I mean, we never intended for this to happen. I swear, Lucinda, I did nothing to encourage Anthony's affection. And nothing to resist them either. Creed! Where uh, the devil is that servant? Yes. Creed! Yes, Miss Lucinda. Prepare the carriage. I'm going for my ride. Yes, Miss Lucinda. Lucinda, please, you are the only family I have. Please give us your blessing. And I beg you for your consent now, Lucinda. I mean, we have been friends for so long, and, and your sister needs you. I mean, she's always looked up to you. The matter is plain, sir. Beatrice can choose you, or she can choose me. If she accepts your proposal, then she is no longer my sister. Lucinda, don't do this. Anthony has made his choice, and now you can make yours. He is penniless, as you will be. You can beg food of the peasants or slave among them, but neither of you will darken my door again. I shall close up this house and go to Paris. Reject him, or be gone before my carriage returns in one hour's time. Creed! 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 Who's there? Who's up on the boat in the dark at this hour of night? It's me, Father. Sharon. Did you hear it too? Hear what? I thought you were in bed long ago, Sharon. I was working late, Father, in the library. I was starting the books for the auction when I heard someone. There was someone out here. Just the wind. There's nobody here. Should the doors bolt it? Now off to bed with you. You look exhausted. But I heard footsteps. Someone running. Ah, probably old Father Riley pottering around upstairs. No, he went to bed hours ago. Sure, who'd want to break in here? There's nothing left to steal in the old place. The sooner that investor pulls the place down, the better, I say. <gasps> After the auction next week, all I want is a nice wee bungalow with no draft. <laughs> now you get yourself off to bed, my dear. There's nothing to be frightened of. <gasps> Look, Father. The cabinet. The door. It's been opened. See, I told you. Someone has been in the house. Now yeah, shut that out, things ancient. The hinges are coming off of it, look. Probably blew open from the draft. They didn't take anything. They must have ran off when I put the hall light on. I'd say that old riding crop is of value. We should put it somewhere safe. Ah, uh, the riding crop? Yeah, I reckon that's what they were after. Must be quite rare. It's one of a kind, handmade by Russian jewellers. Well, then, we should definitely put it in the library safe. Oh, no. No, leave it here. This is where it's kept. Look, I lock the cabinet. You go to bed. Everything's back to normal. You know who opened the cabinet, don't you? Yes, there was someone here, wasn't there? No. Oh, please, Father, tell me. If I tell you now, Sharon... Promise not to walk out and leave us in the lurch before the auction. <laughs> not with investors hounding me with their architects or surveyors and the devil knows what. What could make me leave, Father? An old legend. I'm telling you about the family who once owned this house so that you'll know there's no reason to lock your door. I'll tell you in case some local tells you and gets everything wrong. In my opinion, that antique glass cabinet has had a faulty metal class for decades and people are too much in love with superstition to bother fixing it. This little riding crop came all the way from St. Petersburg nearly 200 years ago. Who owned it? It was the wedding present of a Russian prince, no less. Wow. He'd swept the eldest daughter of this house off her feet. He might even have made her happy had he lived. 
She met him after she fled to Paris, but their marriage only lasted a year. They'd honeymooned in St. Petersburg, where the prince presented her with this bejeweled riding crop. Her name was Lucinda, although when she returned to Tipperary as a widow in bad health, she called herself Princess Orloff. How did he die? The plague. St. Petersburg had been hit hard. Did she ever remarry when she came back? She died a lonely woman. Some Tipperary families still talk about their ancestor seeing Lucinda being driven every day in her carriage. It was the only time she was ever seen, taken a full hour each day to be driven around her estate. The woman owned every local thing, with one exception. What was that? The heart of her childhood sweetheart. He married her younger sister, Beatrice. Oh. Lucinda cut the newlyweds off before going to Paris. Marriage to Prince Orloff might have softened her heart had she not returned a widow, with the married couple in the cramped gate lodge, a daily reminder of how happiness had passed her by. Oh, she must have been very bitter. There are old women in this parish just kept alive by bitterness. Lucinda sacked every servant, except her butler, Creed, who was her sole contact with the world. She refused to see anyone. Creed did the shopping and was rarely seen himself except during her ritual daily drive through her estate. Here she comes again, like clockwork, every afternoon at five past three. Go out and stop her carriage. I cannot stand any more of this, Anthony. Ten years we've been living hand to mouth. The peasants have more to eat than us. If you were any sort of decent man, you'd confront her. For my sake. But she won't listen. She never stops. Uh, she enjoys driving past just, just, just to punish us. Please, Anthony. Maybe today she will take pity. Every day you have this chance, yet you are too cowardly. I am no coward. But even though we are penniless, I, I still have a little dignity left. I am tired of hoping for her to have a change of heart. She has no heart, Beatrice. In the sight of her sitting stiff and regal in that carriage with her damn riding crop sickens me. She has Creed drive her past simply to taunt us in our poverty. My father would turn in his grave if he knew how I am treated, with my husband too cowed to confront her. How can you say that? How often have you seen me stand in the dust of that road with my hand raised and her damn servant almost running me over? And not once... Not once has that woman even deigned to bestow upon me the merest nod of her head. I mean, all I ever get from Creed is a, a quick, furtive, fearful salute, like he is terrified of losing his livelihood if she sees him even acknowledge that I exist. Poor Creed. He is a good man. He has been with my family for years. I pity him in that big house alone with her. She has received no visitors for almost ten years. I often wonder why he has stayed with her. He always looks so troubled. Frightened almost. I mean, she must be a hard mistress. Keeping him there to wait on her every whim. Perhaps today she will relent. I will try talking to her. Creed will stop for me. I know it. He has known me since I was a child. He knows that someday I will be mistress of this estate after my sister dies. Unless I starve to death first. If I go, he will stop the carriage. As my wife, I forbid you. If you won't face her, I will. Beatrice! Beatrice! I don't care anymore. I'd sooner die than starve any longer. Let go of me. Creed, stop this carriage. Move out of the way. Miss Beatrice, step aside, please. Whoa, whoa, boys, whoa. Oh, forgive me, sir. I can't do this anymore. Beatrice, you could have been killed. I feared so too, sir. Forgive me. It's your mistress I won't forgive. Forgive her, sir. Please. Uh, Lucinda. Step out of your carriage. I, I need to talk to you. I mean, how long can you let us suffer? Sir, I beg you. Look, stay out of this man. She will speak to me this day. She, she can't, sir. Now, won't you mean? Too arrogant. Too bitter. Damn you, Lucinda. Do you hear me? Damn you for what you've done to us. She can't, sir. She, she can't hear you, sir. What do you mean? Lucinda! Oh, miss, don't approach the carriage. Creed, I demand to know what's going on. She... She was a, a strict mistress in life, ma'am, and no less stern and strict in her death. Death? Forgive me, sir. 
I know she wronged you. What? But she wrote down my instructions in a letter and forced me to sign it in my own blood. I don't understand. I've been too scared to disobey her instructions. It's been nine years since the men came down from Dublin to embalm her. She died of the same plague that killed her husband. It's been a living nightmare, sir, lifting her corpse up in this carriage every afternoon and placing the riding crop in her hand and then placing her in her bed every night with the riding crop in the glass display cabinet that she'd specially made for the hallway. I've wronged you, Miss Beatrice, kept you from your inheritance, but I was more scared of her dead than alive. And this is the same riding crop? Neither Beatrice nor her husband lived long after inheriting the house. It went to some distant relative, then was bought as a seminary. The riding crop was included. At times, different abbots put it in the cellar or the attic, but all held it break loose at night, with footsteps, doors banging. Once the riding crop was left back where she wanted it, the house had become peaceful again. Occasionally, some of the priests over the years claimed to see a woman's figure in the hall bending over the cabinet, or hear the noise of hooves at night, but I never believe that. But I do believe this. Once that writing crop is left here, you can sleep peaceful and disturbed by no one. You won't desert us now, will you? Not <laughs> laugh to the auction. I don't believe in ghosts, Father. Nor I. It's just the rusty clasp on that cabinet that makes it fall open some nights. Whoever buys the house can have it. There'll be no room in my nice new bungalow. <laughs> Leave it there and we'll say no more about it. Did Lucinda really have herself embalmed? Yes, it even made the London papers. You'll find the newspaper cutting somewhere in the library. Now go to bed, Sharon, and sleep well. <laughs> Good night, Father. Oh, there we are. The clasp is good and tight. Good night, Lucinda. Cast in Haunting Women were Doreen Keogh, David Kelly, Alison McKenna, Jodie O'Neill, Dawn Bradfield, Simon Delaney, John Hewitt, Luke Griffin, Hannah R. Gordon and Rosanna Brown. Haunting Women was written by Dermot Bolger and directed in Belfast by Gemma McMullen.